my name is Dell, and I'm a full-time day trader and educator over at ActiveTraders.chat. I'm proud to announce a new series, Bear vs. Pig, candid interviews with micro to small cap stock traders. Unlike any other series you'll hear online, it's not catered towards beginners, and we are exploring a very specific niche in stock trading. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. Today's guest on the show is Jay Trader, a very successful trader from San Marino, Italy, a small city with a population of only 30,000 people. What's more is that he's been trading for 19 years, so you can imagine the wealth of knowledge that we'll have access to in this next hour. Jay Trader started trading at the age of 18, straight out of high school, and has been a professional trader ever since. From Italian stocks to Forex, futures, and now U.S. equities, Jay Trader is driven, passionate, and very good at what he does. After following him for a very long time on Twitter and admiring his almost supernatural ability to pick tops, I know firsthand the impact that this trader has had on the community. And I'm very happy that he's agreed to let me pick his brain in the middle of the trading day. Today, you can find Jay Trader running a small cap trading room as part of the Smash the Bit community. I've had the chance to shadow him over the past couple of days and have gotten to see how both him and Smash trade on a daily basis. Smash primarily trades mid to large cap stocks and options and Jay Trader primarily trades micro to small cap stocks and supplements his trades with large cap plays. Over 70% of Jay Trader's trades are on the short side. Okay, uh, welcome Jay Trader. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode number two of Bear vs. Pig. Uh, maybe say hello to the community and uh, we'll get started from there. Hello, fellas. <laughs> uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how old are you? Uh, what stocks do you currently trade? And where do you trade from? Okay. So I'm 37 years old. Um, and uh, I started training when I was 18 in high school. Um, coming from a humble family, I live in the small, in the oldest republic in the world, San Marino. And I trade, I always traded from my home. My dream was always to become a trader since I was small. And uh, when I started, I thought it was everything so easy uh, because I was looking at people, uh, looking at the newspaper and buying this or that stock. We are talking about at that time, 99, 2000, uh, Italian stock market, you know, Fiat, all this stuff. And then I uh, saved some money in the summer. I went a uh, summer job in one month and a half, two months. I lost everything I put away. And that was like the best thing for me because I started understanding that I had to study and study much more. So I remember still like I was the time by my parents' house. And my dad was coming home very late, like two or three o'clock in the morning and used to see me still awake studying charts uh, at the time we had like you know Barry Rood, Tony Oz, Linda Rashka and all this and that was my first uh, time really digging into studying and um, when I started uh, there was a tech moment in Italy so everything you have like Netflix, uh, you have um, Yahoo and all the stuff mm -hmm. those were the, the gold times in the Italian stock market and there were the cover warrants and warrants. And I started trading them mostly according to simple technical analysis and tape reading. So for me, the time in sales and the book, the level two, uh, that, yes, yeah, pretty same, the same now. But uh, that time, the market maker were behaving in another way, especially in the cover warrants, because in Italy, they were not regulated. And many times they used to cut the volatility, don't pay. So if the stock moved like 5% in a day, the cover warrant could move 50, 100, 150, more than options today, more. And 
I became pretty good in that and had like three very, very good years. Um, so this is like my first uh, step into the, in the stock market, uh, in the Italian market. Wow, that's quite the story. And, and you uh, told me that you started when you were 18 years old or 19 years old, straight out of high school. Can you take us through that a little bit? Yeah, um, the fact is that uh, my family uh, comes from like, um, not poverty, but you know, we were not rich. Humble beginnings. Humble beginnings, yes. Uh, pardon my English. I'm American for half of my citizenship, but I mostly talk Italian here. <laughs> Anyways, um, I started uh, wanting to do something for my parents, my family. So I, I wanted to earn and earn their respect. And uh, I always liked stock market uh, because my um, uncle uh, in America, uh, he is a very good experienced trader for the Morgan Trust. And um, since when he was coming to see me, he was always looking at stocks, earning and this, and I wanted to do the same, exactly the same. But it was very hard to work, uh, go to high school, because work I want to put the money to invest, uh, train, because I like to train a lot, and then trade. So all fix the four things together is the most difficult thing, especially when you're not still a pro. When you're a pro, like, oh, you're self-sufficient, you earn your money, so you can, like, trade whenever you want. Instead, when you are, like, part-time, you have to work, study, do all your stuff, you know, to, to try to survive. Those are the hardest moments, I think. And, and what would you say was your main motivator when you had just finished high school and you were weighing whether you should be joining university or taking some kind of a, a different path? What, what was your main motivator to trade? To make money and my main motivators were my parents uh my mother my father they're like they they taught me everything in life so i'm really they are like my model you know when they see who's your hero and not some like uh superstar but them because they taught me in everything you want this life is tough you have to sacrifice everything for what you really love and only if you dig 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 many times i have fails in my in my work in market but always i stood up and go through this you know uh so this was definitely my my key in the process yeah, and that's probably the reason why you were so driven so early on in your career yeah that is it's like mike tyson <laughs> he had nothing and when you have that hunger you want to conquer something, you know, you, you have to do something, otherwise you remain always in the same station. Uh, so it's always like an inner sense of improving and getting better in something that you really feel it's yours. For me, this was. That's really powerful. And I think that's something a lot of traders need to take away is you really need that level of drive. Um, so let's move on to the next piece. I had the chance to sit inside of your trading room and listen to you and uh, see how you trade. And so that, that really helped a lot, especially in doing homework for the interview. Uh, but I did hear somebody in the background. So who is that trading beside you uh, <laughs> where you are? Well, that's my my partner. <laughs> I would say she's my mom. And uh, I have two big Dell 43 and other two monitors vertical. And it's a little bit too much sometimes to check everything. So she has experience. She started like before I started and she trades mainly futures. Uh, so she helped me following stocks now. She loves it. She's starting to get into small caps as well, but still, you know, she prefers the, the futures or the big caps, um, maybe for the amount of money you can invest in. Uh, but she's really like a great partner. Sometimes she tells me, respect your system, respect your stops, because even if I have like this knowledge, I'm always like down to the psychology. And I was reading some blog these days, uh, a friend, Piggy's Trader, he says something so true. 
you always have to fight with your psychology, with your ego, you know? You become too cocky sometimes, having like uh, last month, one beautiful month, I think two red days. I'm having like few red days uh, in, the, in the last month, few red days. But one day I did like a tremendous mistake on AWX. And even I know everything, flow rotation, even I was up 80 cents, I was stubborn. I didn't cover anything. And I got to the end of the day, I uh, stopped on that. Not on that big move to 19 the day before. Yeah, I think AWX was one of those hot stocks that everyone's been talking about. I know we were chatting on that. Actually, the day that, that AWX was taking off is when I had my conversation with Hammer Trader. So why don't you take us through what happened on AWX? Um, AWX, um, to be honest, I knew something was on. I was talking with a friend of mine and we were talking. They heard some news that probably some guy was in this, was on this. So anyways, I waited for my setup. I saw super low float and uh, on the 26 and 27, I shorted both days. And actually the, um, the 26, I had a very good average, very good. But even I know it's flow rotation, even know that there were strong volume on the reclaim of the VWAP, which many times tells me uh, scale out some or like go completely out of the trade. I was stubborn. I was saying, oh, this is an all-day fade. You know, I had my target price set in my mind. I was talking with some other guys. Yeah, yeah, we all own this. And then stubborn, I closed it for uh, 40 cents loss on that day, 30, 40 cents loss on the day. Then um, I almost didn't touch anymore. A little bit of scalp on the 27. The findings came out. Uh, we had like the confirmation, um, somebody bought a big chunk on this about the float and and then even if you have this manipulation you can see the same pattern on awx on gbr you can see the same pattern on torque in the pre-market they tend to do like a big big push and something like around the cup with a neckline each time that neckline even today on iht you have this neckline cut you can have a good expectation for phase so like risking one to get three or four you know Right now, would you consider yourself a, a, a primarily a short seller? And if you are, then what are you trading inside of that short selling market? Are you, you trading the piggies all the time or are you trading the large caps as well? So I started uh, only longs. When I started in the Italian market, it was only longs. And then uh, I was with Cover Warren so I could buy calls or puts. And uh, instead, here on the US market, I find myself uh, particularly attracted by a little uh, bunch of stocks that I call POS, it means like all the piggies, if you want to say like this better. Mm -hmm. And 70% uh, I'm sure, 30% I'm long, but not only on the piggies. I like to trade the big gaps, and this can be as well on the, the big caps. So, like this day, Whirlpool, uh, PZZA uh fcau and today trip tiva and then i like to play uh these on earnings or the options generally i focus on tesla netflix uh, apple for options and so you supplement your large cap trades uh, with options trades or do you do you ever only trade options instead of shares on the large caps i trade both example Yesterday, uh, I was on Apple, and when I saw that Apple broke that morning high and retest that support, that dip buy, I was adding my position there. And I was holding this, I hold it today, and that was almost a 300% gain for me. Uh, but I like to enter both on the stock and both on the option. Generally, I prefer the option if I have to hold this trade for one, two, three days. So according to that, I choose or weekly, if let's say it's Monday or Tuesday, or if uh, I want to get for a longer strike, I go with a monthly. Mm -hmm. And why did you start trading the small to micro in the small to micro cap world? 
um, one time I read um, one sentence that I think was Eric Wood, which I respect a lot. And he was saying, uh, these piggies uh, first or then, they always come down. The majority, they will all come down. And uh, it's true. The only thing is that we have to find out the timing and when they have dilution and the filings. So everything put together, you can't have one if you don't have the other one. So that's why going short is true. Many times I'm long pre-market on the Momo, low flow catalyst. I love that because you can have like great moves. Remember the first days, Elfin, RKDA and AKD, they were flying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then they all failed. But the important thing is to get the right timing. Like AWX would eventually fail. It's 3 today, 3.20, 3, 3 3.30. Uh, you have to get only that moment. And what techniques do you use to capture that moment? I use uh, technical analysis, volume. And volume for me is tape. That's the main key with the filings and financials. So... Uh, First of all, the first thing I see is the news. I need to know the news. I'm a very good reader of the news. I have the last three years or two years on something, all stocks that moved on gaps with the uh, relative news, uh, the filings and everything. And I know how much they failed according to that news or, or something else. Example, I can make an example, I always say uh, in the bio, uh, when you have like phase one, or mid phase or phase half B trials. All this is a big gap, pop and drop, always. Only to be attentive on the phase two, because generally they, they tend to uh, make an offering, raise an offering, because they need money for the phase three. And the phase three approval generally is like big gap, small pullback, and probably like all day grinding up. So I'm always staying away from that. And other things, uh, the approvals, patent, all the stuff. So I know it's news, generally what the news will, will come out to, you know. And do, do you ever go long on those stocks that are grinding up? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I like not many setups. I have like eight, ten setups for short and two setups for the long. And generally, like, I like to enter long pre-market on a break up a cup, if I see very low float, if I see mom, if I see a good catalyst and people are jumping in, but you have to be pretty quick. Sometimes they start like 7.30, 8 o'clock. So you need a, a broker that allows you to trade per market. And, um, and then I like the late afternoon uh, longs, like we had CEI, uh, you have like the first day holding above VWAP, very high volume catalyst you wait for a dip and you try to long maybe not a full position but one third one half uh into the next day uh hoping for a gap up how do you know how do you go about finding stocks in the first place uh in the morning i look for three things i look for twitter news so I like a bunch of people bio people um earning whisper that i look then when I see like there is range for me, when I have a big gap, example, on a trip today or on Tiva, and I know how they move, I tend to focus on them. So I look at the, at the scanners, Twitter, and then everything that bumps up in chat. You know, we are like so many, we have so many information lately that the problem is that the majority of people can't focus on one, two things only because they get confusional and they try to focus on eight, 10 things at a time, but mm -hmm. we're not all like, you know, super traders have uh, another person next that trade with you and takes other trades. Uh, you have to focus, I think, at least if you're not still a pro on one, two uh, trade, uh, that's it. Because if you focus the tape, as I focus like for hours, 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 till my high tiers, here, I, I can follow like five, six stocks. Maybe just the technical analysis, maybe it's just a chart, but if I want to focus on the tape, one, two is more than enough. Yeah, and there's two things in there that I really want to unpack. Number one, um, 
how do you go about gaining the confidence in a trade? And I think that would lead us to another question that I heard that you talked about, um, that you keep information on stocks and on the plays and on the fundamentals. And I, I want to unpack some of that with you as well. So first off, maybe a broad question, how do you gain confidence in a trade? Um, I size, let's say one, when I have just a technical analysis uh, pattern, like this morning IST, uh, I saw the filings, the financial, there was nothing for me like great, but I like the daily, I like the resistance, I like the pops, I like the selling, I saw it 270s, so I jumped in. Uh, instead, when I have like dig into the, the filings, when I see like an S3, when I see like an ATM, when I see like in the 10Q, I can find warrants at a certain price, then, and I see this already from pre-market, just think about NBRV and many of these, they're still like diluting already in pre-market or ATM and Y. Uh, so I jump there three times more my size and they tend to go for the all day fade. Uh, sometimes we have um, some stock that still they have a shelf, but they wait a day two or day three to dump everything. Okay. So that's our, the most sketchy, but if you have the plan, you can have like two, three paper cuts and then you nail the big one with a heavy size. Wow. And you keep track of all of this information. And I do, I also want to unpack a lot of the fundamental analysis stuff that and we'll get into. And it's sort of a continuation of our last podcast with Hammer Trader, I guess. Uh, but you keep Excel sheets and you keep information and data on all of these stocks, correct? Absolutely. I have Excel open right now. I have a uh, hundred of stocks. And well, why, why do you do it? And then wh what do you keep? Well, I could use just example, some software that you can see the intraday or pre-market in the past. But I like to, let's say this morning, IST, right away, open my Excel, I still look how much the person institutional is on this. If it's above 40%, uh, example, I am stay away from big size, only if I see dilution on or a shelf. And um, I look the financials. So I try to look how much they're burning per month, how much cash they have left, how much is the network capital, how much is the debt. And this brings me to the consideration. How desperate are uh, they looking for money? How desperate they are? So if they have a, like a deadline, maybe a 550B or so the listing and then try to raise money right away i know to attack big and so on this excel i have the daily and the intraday especially of the pre-market and of the volume because i want to see the volume i react in pre-market i know from that volume no let's say like i have good odds to know from the pre-market if that's going to flow rotate if that's going to push up uh or if that will fail so I try to look the volume, the five, the, the pre-market, the first five minutes, the first 30 minutes, and that tells me what will be the rest of the day. Oh, so um, that, in, that type of information will help you make a better decision when you're looking to add to the trade, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If I see, example, a stock that have no dilution on, in a stock that already retraced pre-market to some EMA. Generally, I like to use a 200 EMA on the one or others. Uh, then I know that this is, if, even if it's full of volume, this can flow rotate. So everybody has FOMO. I always say, don't have FOMO. Maybe sometimes you lose the trade, but wait that the stock spikes up again. Uh, you could trade and short and add each time short below VWAP 10 years ago. Now things are different. You have to adapt to the market. And many people will agree with me. Uh, you have to short the pops and cover into the dips. You cannot short on weakness right now because on a flow rotation, low float, or SSR with high volume, you will get squeezed. And by squeezed, you mean 
that uh, the buyers will continue accumulating, grinding sellers up, and then explode, and 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 flip the uh, the uh, stops of the sellers. Exactly, exactly. Um, I was looking example on um, AWX. That's a the perfect example, and. One one setup I always look is for the midday VWAP reclaim with abnormal volume. We used to like on a five minute candle bar, a volume plus one million plus or seven eight hundred plus, and it's like two one thirty in the afternoon. Stay away from that. If you remember IMTE check, AWX they all do this pattern. So know the pattern, know the past, try to predict what can happen. I think a lot of traders have a hard time with, I mean, they'll, they'll find those stocks that pop up and especially in the micro small cap world, you see these stocks that pop up and wash out over and over and over again. But I think very few traders fully understand the story as, as to why this happens. Um, and I know personally that until I realized that I'm, I'm reading the filings, not because I'm trying to look for like some hidden number that's going to help me pick a, a an exact entry point, but because it's sort of like this story that goes for years, maybe around what the company's doing to raise money. First thing you need to look for is uh, the S3, which is the shelf offering, and then after that, you need to see the 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 effect. It's actually E F F E C T, the effect as the filing, and then the last thing you need to see is the four two four, which is the actual offering and in in my understanding this allows the the traders to begin collecting the money that say that they were going to raise uh, by selling stock and diluting the stock and increasing their balance sheet is is that accurate absolutely this is this is the point that tells me the conviction to add size on a trade um i have examples here of all these all day faders or like morning pop and fade and the majority uh, have an offering and the majority have warrants um, if you remember example um, we had a ETI some in the past had a big shelf uh, 25 million I was looking for this in a thank you sometimes you don't have only to see uh, the the last effect and the offering because you maybe have many spikes and maybe those spikes were with high volume so you don't know how much they sold that's why i go to the thank you i look uh offering or i look for shelf or i look for uh, the money or the stuff and i look how much they already raised okay so uh, many of these they they play like this but you have to dig both uh thank yous and both uh, uh effect and uh, an offering uh what other information would you tell people on the fundamental side uh, that they need to pay attention to or something that uh that you maybe you've you've found helpful when you are in the thank you uh, because sometimes it's very old look for at the market uh, because when you have that they can dilute when they want anytime then another thing uh, I think people don't take too much into consideration when you have a high percentage in institutional it will be harder to dump if they don't have the, the illusion so only if you have a gap with a catalyst doesn't mean that each gap goes down uh, the gap can rotate uh, go up for a couple of days, three, four, five, six days, or some like ECs, like I, like here, never come back down anymore. So mm. you have always have to have a plan, look the volume, the tape, and the filings all together. The other thing I, I was talking before is to see the cash they have left and the cash they burn each month. So you go in a thank you, uh, you go in the, um, the K, and you look for uh, the three months example. Now I was looking some filing. The first three months, how much they burn. You divided that, and you see how much they burn uh, this year each month. 
how much they have left and how much they burned last month, last year, sorry, the first three months. So you can make like comparisons. In your trading room, how do you uh, mentor these newer traders to use the information in the right way and have a good balance between that and technical analysis? The fact that is that uh, I'm not a marketer. I'm just a trader. Uh, my room is very, very small. I have few subs. And um, this is because I think time and experience have a, have a price, you know, even for respect. So I don't uh, teach or DVD all the stuff. I just show what I do, how I think. And I always tell guys, don't follow, learn your process. I like very much AT09, and I hope he will listen to this and some other guys with him. I respect them a lot. And he says always this thing, learn the process. Uh, you can learn to Dell. You can learn to JTrade. You can learn to Smash. You can learn to AT, Modern Rock, whoever, these guys. Absorb everything from them. Absorb and try to absorb all they know, and then make it yours. Because maybe uh, you Dell, you short the stocks in a complete different way how I trade them. Maybe I short the morning, maybe short the late day fade, say the uh, late day uh, phase setup. And um, that's why I show what I do. I analyze the tape mostly. So I say, where's the hidden buyers, where's the soak, uh, when they're absorbing, when there is a stuff, and all these things. Example, uh, an important key factor for my trading is the tape and is the volume divergence. And uh, these days, people, because I post something on Twitter, um, they was asking me, what is? Essentially is you have to take uh, more than one chart. You have to take, example, I take a one, a three, and a five. Let's say this morning IHT. I was looking each pop that had on the one minute chart with a relative volume. And when you see that mm -hmm. there's like higher pops, but with less buying volume over there, and you see even spikes means they're dumping. There is some big seller up, and that is probably going to fade. Maybe not all day fade. Don't misunderstand me. But a good pullback make you enter short with a low risk setup. So I try to see this on the one, three, and five minute to have a clear idea each time from what it's doing. And visually, you're talking about the volume, say, going down and the stock price continuing to uh, create new highs. Exactly. But you also see on the tape many times, I was looking at this on um, AMYND and ATLC, if I'm right. Yeah, ATLC. I'm just looking right now. That day in the afternoon, the stock was going from 270 till 310. And I can was you give us a date on that so that people can follow along with you? So, sure. The 31st of uh, July this year, when we claim, reclaimed the VWAP at 12.50 in the afternoon at 1 o'clock, uh, it was heavy. It was heavy because if you see the volume, each pop that it made was with lower volume. And when it made that stall, was not to write a stuff, a stall at 145, 140, 148. I'm just looking at a bigger time frame right here. Uh, you could see a bunch of sellers there. So each time was making pops, was selling, pop selling, pop selling, and always less uh, mm, green volume, let's say green like for the buyers, and always more sellers stepping in. It's like, it's like the example, if you are on a ladder, if you are on the stairs, you try to go up, and these come always against you. The faster, the faster, the faster. At a certain point, you're going back as well. So the next question is, how do you use technical analysis indicators like this to make decisions in the market, and which, which indicators are most important to you? Okay, so um, the indicators... I look at are support and resistance. These are the main factors. Then the volume and some EMA or VWAP. EMA is because, especially in the daily, you have to look where the institutional are paying attention. 
and they look the bigger uh, picture. They look the big uh, moving average example, 200 moving average, SMA or e EMA, EMA. They tend to be support many times or resistance. Look all the earnings, and many times I try to add on these earnings uh, when I see a gap down below the 200 EMA because people there will sell, institutional will sell. So these are the main indicators I look to. Then always with a tape, always with a tape. Mm -hmm. And you've also mentioned to me that uh, range is something that's important to you as well. Absolutely. Uh, many times I see stocks uh, from one, they pop to 120. And for me, that is not enough. I want at least uh, a gap. 40, 50% or more. And uh, the more this pops, if you remember that morning torque, and I knew this, uh, this news about torque that would pop and fail because I track a lot, a lot of times. Uh, I was just waiting a moment, but this went from nine to 28. And then right away died, completely died at the open. And like AWX did the last day. Uh, so wh what do you do on days that you know that the stock is going to be really difficult to borrow? Do you, how big is borrowing uh, a problem for you? Um, <laughs> it's a problem uh, to the moment that the trade becomes a stop. Because still I have my gains, okay, maybe 10, 20, uh, 30% can be uh, a fee, you know? for the bars. But when you have like a, a bad trade and a stop, <laughs> then becomes a problem. Otherwise, it's, it's part of the game. I mean, like, if would be a problem, I would go long. That's it, only do options. So I won't pay, pay anything. But still, like, you know, they, they are like from 10 to 30% of my position, my gains. Wow, and w where did you learn technical analysis. Is there any one place that you learned? Studying everything I could find uh, and buying uh, really dozens of book back in the 2000, 99, 2000, 2001 from the States. Uh, luckily, I knew English. So uh, I remember all these, uh, you know, Jeff Cooper, uh, Robbie, uh, no, uh, Larry Williams, all these systems, you know, so everything I could read mm -hmm. about volume, divergencies, Elliot, GAN, Fibonacci, you know, the, the, the old guys know this stuff, you know, uh, stochastic, trying to find the, the perfect combination of stochastic. So everything is like, was a big picture. Then I used to get a chart. I used to cover half of the chart. I used to trace my, my support and trend lines. And I tried to, to discover each time what was going to do. So it was a lot like putting my mind, putting my mind, putting my mind, all these setups. And then when I see them now, they're like uh, easier to determine and uh, to trade. Uh, you said that you've gone from Italian stocks and Forex and futures and equities. I mean, I didn't trade Italian stocks, but I definitely traded fut uh, futures and Forex. And one of the main things uh, or one of the main reasons why I enjoyed futures so much was because of all of the volume information. I guess my question is, um, how did trading futures or Forex um, help you in trading equities? Uh, Forex really didn't help me much. Um, I still don't like that market and it was just like for um, a small period. And um, that was not, was not my niche, it was not going good for me nothing to do with the, the stock and the equities and cover warrants I did before. Uh, futures is because uh, there's plenty of liquidity. And okay, it's not like exciting, like trading the stocks with all these news, uh, digging the filings, uh, each day a different stock, three, four gaps. No, it's different. Uh, I was trading mainly yes, uh, YM and uh, CL. So for who knows, uh, see all examples of crude oil. And um, I used to trade mainly uh, 
different from uh, from stocks, mainly with support resistance and looking at the, the volume. I had market delta at the time and I was looking at the volume profile. So every now and then I see people are asking what is volume profile, what is point of control. And uh, thanks to my cats, he brought it up like a couple of months ago in his charts, maybe even more. Uh, people know now what, what is, but this is something like on the market like 10 years or more already. Yeah, that was one of the big things that surprised me when I moved from futures over into trading equities is that people didn't really use, um, you know, volume profile or session volume or things like that. Um, and like for me, our, our entire strategy or my entire strategy is built around volume profile or market auction theory, all the stuff that you would find normally inside of futures. And actually, I find that it works extremely well in in small to micro cap equities. And I don't know why. I think it's because it's more pure in the sense that there's not as many algos and crazy institutionals, you know, dumping on every pop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think like maybe 5% of the people now now use it. Uh, you could see an example today, uh, a second on IHT. If you just look the five minute volume profile, you see that 260 there was like, full of volume full of volume so that is like where the supply and demand have the most uh has the big fight you know have the big fight and from there they decide if this breaks retesting goes up or rejects the 260 and come down and as manufacturers rejected all those toppings there so volume profile is essentially looking the volume at a certain price and trying to see the biggest point of control means the biggest point of volume where uh, the majority of volume was concentrated. Yeah, exactly. It's volume at price and volume at time. And right now, people, I mean, for the most part, are only using volume at time, which is the volume that you see at the bottom in sort of vertical um, histogram. I would be blind if I only looked at that volume. I would be blind. Blind like the people who trade only the chart, not looking at the, the tape. Exactly. I'm totally in your boat there. We'll definitely have to do a, an episode on um, volume profile. And uh, I'm going to rant for a while on market auction theory. But um, <laughs> Okay, so I've got another question for you. Where did you learn how to read and interpret corporate filings? Uh, this is a big question. <laughs> uh, I started reading everything I could on OSPEX research. I had uh, I have a good friend, uh, Jordan. Uh, he explained me a lot of filings. He's a very good uh, guy. He's a very good trader. And I'm every day with him and another friend on uh, Skype. And uh, uh, he taught me a lot. Then the other was only like, taking each gap in the past, each move in the past, go to see the news and go to see the funny. Only like this, you have everything there. It's just like you want to do it, you want to use your time for this, or you prefer spending a Saturday and Sunday going out with the girlfriend or with the kids. I spent my time looking at this filing those days. Or maybe if I wanted to stay with my, par my friends, at the night I was studying three, four, or five hours more just to see what was the filing there and how it reacts. It's only like with experience and trying, trying, trying. That's it. Uh, there are some very good guys in filings, much better than me. For example, Ricky, Adam, the guy, I always talk with him. And each one of these guys is very, very humble and can help you if you DM it. Do you have any online resources uh, besides the people on Twitter? that people can use for either looking up filings or understanding them better? Yes. First of all, BAMSEC, B-A-M-S-E-C. Uh, you can even like register your email and uh, click on the updates on the filing. So each time example, HMNY at this reverse split as a news has a filing coming out directly, you'll see in your email in the morning or when it comes out. Uh, then they are all divided. I really like the website. Uh, it's very, very good. 
Um, okay, so a question that I have for you, and it's, I actually got this question from Twitter, um, uh, and the question is, uh, what does it take to be successful in the small to micro cap world? Discipline. Once you have your setup, it's only about discipline. The majority of the people, at least asking them, they have two problems. One, revenge trading, especially after big loss. And the big loss is, is directly connected to not respecting the stops. So these are the two main leaders for the fail of the trader. Uh, you know how many times I bang my head against the wall because maybe I had like two or three weeks so great and then one stop I didn't trigger, I didn't trigger, maybe I add and I lost everything I did that month and maybe even the month before. This happened a lot. The fact that uh, the more you become emotionless and the more you are disciplined, the more you will be success successful. You need only a system that gives you a one, two return. So risk one, return two, and a 50-50, and, and you will become rich, okay? But every day it's a fight with your, with your inner side, you know? I mean, one of the largest problems that I see is that people will have focus for a short period of time, and then they'll have a big loser, and they will completely throw away their strategies and their, their setups, and they will, they'll, they'll go out and they'll try to find the, the most popular trader online, and they'll try to mimic them. And that cycle continues and continues for years on end. So can you tell us about any blow-ups that you've had in the past? <laughs> um, um, I remember the, the first and was like the most tragic for me because I started with all the best purpose of the world. Like I was doing this for a good cause to help my family also to, to make some money for me working from home. So like I felt invincible, you know, the starting with if I want something, I was thinking you will have it. Well, it's not that easy. Uh, so I remember that summer, it was 19, 18. I put all my money and I, I lost everything not having the knowledge. So now I see all these guys writing on Twitter. Uh, they have an account that they write me. Uh, they have a $2 account, $2,000 account, $5,000 account, and they lost everything. Well, first of all, I think you need a big amount of money, uh, at least 10K to start. Uh, you can trade with smaller accounts, but I will consider that only making experience in taking your fails and uh, in uh, using the stops and understanding the overall market, you know. And uh, then something else is building your account. Once you have the knowledge, once you have the discipline, then you can start thinking to build your account. And building all, all an account is really all about risk management. So you talked about sizing in a little bit. Do you have a methodology for sizing in uh, for small accounts versus large accounts? Do you have any recommendations? Yeah. Uh, uh, sizing in or scaling out um, is my uh, is the main reason why you are a pro trader or not. Uh, many times, example, um, I was on a trade. I was looking. I was short almost to the top, and this trade had um, a failed breakout to the upside. I scaled there half the position knowing that if that level would still push up, maybe bounce and go up, I would be all out. If this was failing with a stuff or failed breakout, I will re-add again for the short. And this a lot of times saves your money, okay? You reduce your stops. And this is also part to scaling out where you're like on a winning trade. I remember today on a trip uh, at 49, I was in from 50. I scaled out half. And then we added on the pop, so trading around the core. Uh, generally, I like to take a feeler or two and then add more. Uh, scaling out F when I have my first target, re-adding half of what I, uh, what I gave away, half of what I covered, okay, so that I still have a good average, and then working with that. 
covering, re-adding, covering, re-adding, always maintaining, let's say, the, the first, um, the, 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 the big average, you know, the never core like position. lowering down, exactly, the core position. I think that's a, a great method to use. And I think people start really late into trying to apply something like that. And the other question is, how, how much of your account are you risking in any one trade? I will never risk more than uh, 1% of my account, maybe 2% of my account. Um, okay, there are setups that I go uh, in bigger, but these are my A plus setups. So I use maybe three times more size. Uh, otherwise, I have very low risk profile. Um, and I think this is uh, reflects my character, you know, to be like a little bit careful and wise, maybe because I see too many things happening in the market and I want to be one day like, you know, broke. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is uh, what, what I do. But, but then how many times do you find yourself saying, I wish I had scaled in more? I wish I had gone three or four times what I normally risk in this. I, like, do you miss a lot of those trades because of your methodology? I don't miss much of these trades in terms of like adding that size because I still add pretty good size when I'm very convinced. I may be pissed because many times I tend to cover too soon, especially when you have size because you see that PL and you want to bank. But this is for the new guys. I always tend now to leave one third or one fourth at least of my position for the all day run and possibly overnight. Wow. No matter what, you're you're leaving that position just in case? Yeah. And I use maybe that to a trail like break even plus five, you know, in order that if this has some pops and I'm short, uh, this goes down the whole way. You'd add that stop inside of your broker platform or is it mental? Uh, generally, when I have a position on, I never go away from computer. So my trail, my stops, I always, uh, they are always mental. Was there a point in your career where you had an, an aha moment? Uh, usually like a moment where it clicked in? Absolutely. When uh, I was in um, uh, covert warrants, but it's not the fact that were covert warrants. It can be option, can be stock, can be futures. I start to learn the tape. I start to learn the hidden buyers, hidden sellers, when they were soaking, when they're like putting fake bids and uh, to see the movements of the market maker. So understanding that and understanding the psychology. Uh, when you understand the psychology, so I always try example if I'm short, to look where the, the longs will stop, to look where they will bail out, where they are like on the water, where there are like bag holders on a big gap pop. And you know that on the big gap pop, maybe they're like, uh, they were like in it too. Now it popped from 0 0.50 to, to three, they will tend to go out. So I assume that I go short and going for that profit taking. So knowing and understanding, not just trading the chart and the tape, but understanding the reason why, or the reason why they will take profit or uh, any kind of news that can influence this, that's, that's the, uh, the, the key. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your trading routine. Uh, do you have a routine? Like what time do you wake up in the morning? And then what do you do before and after trading? I am based in Europe. So when it's like 6.30 East, it's uh, 12.30 PM by me. And I generally get three hours before the market opens. I know that somebody lives like Nevada or California. That's crazy. Uh, but you do it because it's your job. So you're the one uh, that steals all of the borrows in the morning. <laughs> Not only me. <laughs> Not only me. But, well, this market became like so, so hard to get borrows. And sometimes you have to really to get that so early that by the moment that the, the, the stock opens, it's already so low that 
I won't even take the, the trade. Uh, but that's the first thing I, I do is uh, I look for, oh, sorry, I first look the news. I look the scanners. And um, after that, I go to see the chart. And after the chart, I go to see the filings and the financial. And the last thing I look is the volume pre-market to give me a general idea. So this is like the routine I do. And do you have anything inside of your uh, pre-trading routine that you do to center yourself psychologically? I like to go train or do a session of cardio because I see that you take out a lot of stress, you, your endorphins, and everything becomes like calmer when you trade because you're already like exhausted from what you did. So when you go there, you don't have FOMO. Many times I, I don't have FOMO. I, I, I control pretty good myself. Even in bad losses, I'm, um, I'm pretty uh, secure. I don't go like out of mind or like bang my head against the wall. Uh, I know what I have to do. And it's a very important physical activity if you're a trader, eating clean, eating good, respecting yourself. This puts you in a mental state that you feel better. You feel more successful, you know? Yeah, I know personally it's super important for me to get good sleep. Um, but I guess you could probably just take a nap before the market opens and you're good to go. <laughs> well, I don't sleep that much. Um so for me, sleep is not maybe eating something good, you know, like when you have some cravings that really helps me in the, in the stock market, especially when it's like, you know, you're having a tough day, eating something sweet, uh, keeps you up. Okay. Uh, well, J trader, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I've had a blast and we've covered a whole bunch of topics. Uh, I can't wait to get this out uh, to listeners. Uh, where can people find you? And if somebody wanted to jump into your room and follow you, what do they do? Uh, just DM me on um, Twitter, JTrader, or uh, write to smashthebit.com. Uh, we're doing something good there, just traders. Um, he's a great trader of options. I taught, uh, taught me a lot. And uh, I have a little small cap room over there, like with few subs. Okay, well, thanks again, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, Udell, for your time, and thanks for this, uh, let's say, conversation. Uh, I was very glad to be here. Well, Jay Trader was just an overall great guy, and I really enjoyed the conversation with him. If you have questions or suggestions about what you'd like to hear on future episodes, send me a message on Twitter at Dell the Trader. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and like the video if you enjoyed the content. To be notified of new episodes, follow me on Twitter at Dell the Trader. And if you want to learn to trade stocks using volume analysis, order flow analysis, and market auction theory, consider joining our community at ActiveTraders.chat.